Eric, and I work as a security researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. And this presentation is about some of the vulnerabilities that uh, both could have and have had an effect on the Ethereum network in various ways. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend in person this year, but I'm uh, very happy that uh, TrustX allowed me to do this presentation remotely. There is a time limit of 16 minutes and we have uh, quite a few vulnerabilities to discuss. So I'm going to just uh, jump straight into it. So as I mentioned, I work in the protocol security research team. We do a lot of different things. Um, security coordination with client teams. We uh, run the bug bounty program. Um, we do uh, fuzzing and manual reviews on uh, things such as the specifications, the different clients, and uh, critical dependencies. It's, uh, it's quite challenging because there is uh, only so many hours per day, and uh, there are a lot of different clients written in different languages, uh, operating on different layers, uh, including application layer and uh, network layer, and of course the, uh, the different client layers, such as the execution layer and the consensus layer. And it's all bleeding edge technology with updates coming continually. So um, because of this, we also try our best to, uh, to augment the uh, security research team by, uh, by utilizing the bug bounty program. So looking at the vulnerabilities discovered and reported from a histor historical point of view, we can see that a lot of them were not discovered by fuzzing, but rather manual reviews. And this is kind of the opposite to today, where a lot of the vulnerabilities discovered are actually true fuzzing. And there are a few reasons for this. One of them is that the fuzzing frameworks are a bit more mature today compared to how they were a few years ago. And uh, of course, with, uh, with fuzzing, you can actually test a lot of code paths um, through automation and uh, discover things that would be kind of hard to discover uh, by means of manual review. But on the other hand, what we do see is that a lot of the vulnerabilities that are discovered through manual reviews they tend to be a bit more severe. So looking at the types of vulnerabilities that were discovered and reported throughout the years, we can see that an extremely small amount of them have been uh, vulnerabilities in the type of remote code ex execution. We have, however, seen vulnerabilities that uh, could have led to, to chain splits and uh, in some cases have also led to chain splits as we will see in some of the in at least one of the vulnerabilities uh, presented soon. We uh, see quite a bit of uh, cryptographic vulnerabilities related to BLS etc and um, the, uh, the vast majority of vulnerabilities that we we have seen has been uh, denial of service vulnerabilities. So this, these type of vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that could uh, take down your, um, your client or uh, cause your client to behave in a way that it cannot uh, complete the tasks assigned. For this vulnerability, we'll do a bit of uh, archaeology because the vulnerability we're about to discuss here uh, even predates the launch of Frontier by multiple months. It was discovered in February of 2015 by Jonas Nick, and the vulnerability itself was about sending negative value transactions. So, why is it a bad thing to be able to send negative value transactions? Well, in this case, a miner could have created a valid block with a, with a block number n that was succeeding 32 bytes. And they could have had a contract mined in that block that would then push n 
onto the stack using the number opcode. And the number opcode then assumed that n was less than 32 bytes, which means that it would end up with a negative result. And using that negative result, we were able to create a transaction with a negative value. And since the transfer method would subtract the transaction value, the contract balance would increase by n minus 2 to the power of 256 plus 1. So pre-frontier, uh, during the early test nets, it was possible to, uh, to create ether out of thin air uh, using this uh, vulnerability. But uh, luckily, it was discovered long before uh, frontier launched. So the issue never reached mainnet. So this is a cryptographic vulnerability that was discovered by Guido. And historically, these types of vulnerabilities tend to be fairly common, even though they generally require quite a lot of expertise to discover and evaluate. We have seen that some of these findings are found through manual reviews, but a lot of them are discovered through differential fuzzing. And uh, differential fuzzing means that we compare the results from two different types of implementations. And in this case, we would use two different uh, cryptography libraries with the same input sent into them. And uh, the output from these different uh, implementations is then compared. And if the results were to differ between either of these implementations, then we know it's something worth explore, exploring further because the, the output should always be the same. In the case of this specific vulnerability, it was discovered that a version of BLAST produced incorrect outputs for some inputs to a specific function. And this could, in theory, have led to the creation of an invalid signature, even though the, uh, the input was uh, valid and correct. There are quite a few different attack vectors when it comes to the, the network itself. And while some of them could, for example, take down a client through a denial of service attack or cause a chain split by simply attacking the, the client or the protocol, this specific vulnerability actually required a node operator to do something uh, in order for the attack to be successful. So this vulnerability was discovered by its Unix I know this, and it affected a lot of the clients. What it did was that it allowed custom text to be added into the log files of uh, multiple clients through the use of network handshakes. And this was possible because many of the clients didn't filter out these types of control codes, which means that the control codes could be sent in the handshake and then logged. So when these, are, when these log files are then opened by the user, the uh, control codes could, for example, Clear the, uh, clear the terminal and only display that text, or it could show blinking ASCII characters, or it could, um, for example, display a warning message that the, uh, that the user had to up their, update their client in order to stay secure, and they could, for example, download the latest version at uh, hps.com slash badsite.com or whatever. Here's another vulnerability that was uh, discovered by Johnny Rea, and this vulnerability exploits the, uh, the limitation of file descriptors in the operating system. So in an operating system, there is a limit on the amount of file descriptors that can be open at any time in order to avoid the system to overload. And the amount of file descriptors being open varies quite significantly between the different operating systems. And uh, these file descriptors are, for example, opened when a new TCP connection is made to the system. And what was discovered was that some clients did not have any limits for incoming connections, meaning new TCP connections. And uh, it, was, it was actually possible to flood these clients with new connections until they ran out of file descriptors. And this meant that when they tried to engage in new tasks, they weren't able to do so as there were no available file descriptors. So this vulnerability is a bit different because not only was it discovered and reported by Guido, it was also exploited on mainnet and other chains. 
It was a vulnerability in Get and Aragon, which was a memory corruption bug within the EVM, which could cause a consensus error. And clients that had not upgraded to the fixed version would obtain a different state route when processing a maliciously crafted transaction. From a timeline point of view, the vulnerability was discovered on the 17th of August 2021. Uh, there was then a public announcement made by the GET team on the 18th saying that there would be a security release on the 24th. On the 24th, the release was made and a race started for people to upgrade before a potential attacker was able to discover where in this uh, update the code uh, there was a fix for vulnerability. Um, on the 27th this was uh, discovered and exploited uh, successfully on mainnet and some other chains. And this caused a minority split of the chain as a ma majority of users had already managed to up upgrade their clients. And these types of vulnerabilities are generally seen as some of the most critical ones because while denial of service attacks can be damaging by, for example, preventing finalization to happen, they are generally solved fairly quickly and users are often able to continue using the network. Chain splits, on the other hand, could create ripple effects where certain entities would decide to use split A and others decide to use split B and others decide to use split C, etc. And this could have a potential negative impact. The GET team run and manage various fuzzers and one of these fuzzers discovered a vulnerability in Golang itself, which was considered a critical denial of search vulnerability as it could have crashed get clients if it was exploited. So to fix this, there was no update necessary to get or code changes in, in get, uh, but instead users had to get the updated versions of Go and then rebuild get in order to stay, stay secure. And this goes to show that there is quite a big supply chain of potential issues that one needs to take into consideration. So it's not simply the code written specifically for the project that could have um, a security impact, but underlying uh, applications and operating systems as well that has to be taken into consideration. Here's a very fresh vulnerability that was publicly disclosed just a few days ago, and it's a vulnerability discovered by Patrick McCardin. The attack itself involves sending ping requests to GET, which is normally not an issue because GET would just uh, respond to that ping request. But the attack used the fact that the peer-to-peer -peer handler would spawn a new Go routine to respond to these ping requests. And the main issue here was that it was possible to flood the node with thousands and thousands of these ping requests, which would then create an equal amount of Go routines. And this could in turn lead to resource exhaustion and a potential crash due to the server running out of memory after enough Go routines were created. This is a peer-to-peer -peer network vulnerability that was discovered and reported by Sayo. It's a denial of service vulnerability that exploited how Lighthouse implemented block by range and to pull off the attack, an attacker would have crafted and sent a malicious block by range message containing a very large count value. And because of the very large count value, this would have caused Lighthouse to panic and then crash. If I were to guess at what types of vulnerabilities we are likely to see more of moving forward, my guess is that it would be peer-to-peer -peer related vulnerabilities because this is an area that has not had as much focus as the other areas. And because of that, we are now spending more cycles uh, reviewing peer-to-peer -peer code and uh, doing fussing on it. And it's also one of the areas where we are now asking people to put efforts into discovering and reporting these issues on. There are also hundreds of more vulnerabilities that I could have spoken about in this presentation, 
and each of these vulnerabilities that I did speak about could easily have been a 60 minute talk on their own. But I hope you learn a bit more about the potential type of vulnerabilities that could have, an, could have an impact on the network itself. And I would be very happy to see new vulnerabilities discovered and reported by you through the Bug Bounty program. If you're also interested in learning more about previously found vulnerabilities, then you can always look up the public disclosure repo that's uh, available on GitHub, where we post previously reported vulnerabilities um, generally after each hard fork. Thank you very much.